So I'm going to talk about style or substance and how I think free software is totally the 80s. Um, have people seen that quiz online, like how 80s are you? Yeah, maybe. All right, you don't have to admit it. It's okay. Um, so I've, I've done, I've seen those, and I, I grew up largely in the 80s. I am, a, this is me on the, on the far right there. Um, I'm, I was a pretty 80s kid. I am actually, I think I'm, I'm at a party dancing to Depeche Mode, wearing sunglasses at night, rocking my Benetton shirt, which I thought was the coolest thing ever at the time. So I was a pretty 80s kid. Um, but even I know that uh, the way that we remember the 80s is not the full picture. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about is how will the free software movement be remembered? So we're going to first get into our time machine and go back and visit the 1980s. Uh, and then we'll talk about how that applies to free software. I promise it is on topic. Um, so uh, you might think of some, some wacky hairstyles from the 80s as being sort of a thing that you remember. Uh, a lot of people remember neon, synth pop, uh, jelly shoes. If, uh, I'm definitely dating myself here. Uh, so like a lot of different things that we think of as the 80s. So if like the 80s had like a PR manager, that that person would be like neon pink, right? Just all, all the way. Um, there was some other stuff. Maybe people remember uh, Pac-Man, which is apparently uh, going to stay with us forever. A new Pac-Man movie coming out this summer, even. Um, and uh, you know, and and a lot of uh, what we think of as video games like came from that era. Uh, does anyone remember this television show? Yep. yep. So this is a TV show about the trials and tribulations of a kid who has to move in with his super rich dad. This is very 80s. Like, the 80s are also very much remembered for being a materialistic generation. And the, the thing that was annoying was his, his dad is basically like a, a child in an adult body and is kind of embarrassing when he has to bring friends over to help him with homework and stuff. Um, and this is uh, unfortunately not my lunchbox, but you can probably get your own on eBay. So the 80s are largely remembered for a lot of the, the fluff, right? Um, and, but I think it's a shame because a lot of other things happened in the 80s, too. Uh, people may remember that the Berlin Wall fell at the end of the 1980s, uh, which is a pretty big deal and has nothing, uh, so far as I know, to do with neon or synth pop. Although my husband said, well, there's that band called Berlin, and I was like, well, that's pretty tenuous. Um, and then also, technology-wise, the 80s were kind of a big era for us as well. Um, this uh, was the first computer that I had, a Commodore 64. And at the time, this was a huge game changer. This was a much more affordable machine that you could have in your house. And a lot of, you know, in your middle class house. I'm, I don't want to gloss over the 80s as if they were this amazing egalitarian tech revolution. But um, you started to seem like we would all eventually have a computer in our house. And most of us do, even if it is actually a phone. Um, this one is, uh, you can see, uh, because of the handle on that one on this side, this is labeled as a portable computer. <laughs> I just thought that was too good to share. Um, but uh, some of the other things, uh, you may remember War Games uh, also came out in the 80s. War Games is a 32-year-old movie now. Uh, what's, <laughs> what, uh, well, anyway, but um, so War Games, we were, uh, you know, we saw, we saw Matthew Broderick using a modem. And so uh, it's kind of this really early idea that not only would we use the computers to do what we wanted them to, but that we would be able to use them to communicate with each other. And hopefully we would not all use them to hack into the government and launch missiles, but, you know, for something a little maybe not as fun but more safe. Um, so, uh, so it was a kind of a huge era as far as our understanding of technology and what was going to be possible, right? Um, you, we also were starting to talk about formats and standards and have those conversations. Um, I, on the video format, I think we can consider the 80s a loss. Beta was supposed to be better. Um, hypertext was being created. This is the dawn of the internet, right? Uh, like we we're talking about how to make all the content accessible to anyone who wants to access it, regardless of what kind of machine they are. So we had this idea from the beginning that there would be 
standards that we would all agree to, even if we wanted to compete on what was produced or what was provided through that standard, but that um, it wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't start to play these games like DRM and things that we eventually ended up seeing. And then, um, of course, I knew you guys were waiting for me to say the GNU project started work in 1983. So I think we can say that uh, the 80s uh, produced a little bit more than um, some embarrassing neon t-shirts and some synth pop. So, um, but unfortunately, we kind of always remember just the, the fluff, and I would like to make sure that we uh, remember the important things. So what were we thinking in the 1980s? <laughs> I, uh, sometimes I get asked that, usually when someone's seen like my class picture from 10th grade or something. Um, I had some poodly hair, much like that lady who I shared with you earlier. <laughs> uh, but so in broad strokes, we were having this conversation about like how to be. Um, and the shorthand for that is the 50s versus the 60s. So. Um, the 50s sort of has come to represent a certain idea in American culture. Uh, if people are familiar, this is Leave it to Beaver. And this is a very idealized picture of America. This is a very white, affluent um, picket fences. Uh, dad has a job, mom doesn't have to work. Uh, the, the most these kids ever had to deal with was like, oh, I told a little fib at school and now I'm, I'm stuck. I, I won't be able to deliver or whatever, or oh, there was that summer where I didn't get to swim because I broke my leg, you know, or, you know. These kids didn't really have, uh, you know, they weren't like dependent on the school lunch program to make sure that they had eaten that day. There was none of that. So there was a, a very idealized picture, but it was also very much about conformity. Like if you uh, remember or ever look at Leave it to Beaver, they kind of scan down the neighborhood before they get to the, the Cleaver's house and every house looks the same. And every family they encounter, you know, with a couple of like, some kids have bigger ears than others and things like that, but you know, and the girls have different color hair, but everyone looks really similar. They're wearing the same clothes, like they have similar jobs, like all the moms stay home. So it's this you know, like if we all conform and do it the way we're supposed to be, then we'll be rewarded with this white picket fence. And so um, unsurprisingly, the people who, uh, you know, the dad of the family uh, of a, a white middle-class American suburb is uh, the person most invested in this idea. It's, it's, it's good to be the king, right? So we're having this conversation during the 80s that keeps playing out of like, you know, and I'm using that as a shorthand, uh, versus the 60s, which is the total other end of the spectrum. That's like the do your own thing generation and, and people are doing drugs and maybe forgetting to put clothes on and like all kinds of stuff is happening. And this was really scary to people who thought like the 50s, we finally, we figured it out, this is how to live. And then their kids like up and got into buses like this and did all kinds of weird stuff. And they're like, what? I, we don't even know what happened here. So, so there was a huge backlash in the way that we talk about the 60s as like, you know, there were riots and violence and, you know, mud and nudity and all the terrible things that would keep you up at night if you were really invested in that 50s idea of America. So um, I'm going to share, I have made some charts to share with you. Uh, the first axis is conformity versus change. So I would say that the 50s are very conformity oriented. And the 60s, the antithesis, are very change oriented. They were questioning everything. Like, you know, why do we have to have doors on the bathroom? Like, why do we have to go to church? Like, why do we have to wear shoes? And, and all kinds of other more, you know, like deeper things. Uh, and then on the other one is sort of this uh, access of motivation. So uh, individual versus community. And so I think. The, the 50s was very like, we're, we've conformed, so we, re, we should be getting our individual rewards. Um, and so, uh, you know, people didn't, there wasn't so much of like asking like, well, who isn't here and why don't they have what we have? It was really like, well, I'm doing it the right way, so I deserve to have what I have. And so um, there's probably gonna be disagreements about where I put things on the chart. That's totally fine. <laughs> uh, but. This is kind of what I've done uh, on the 80s. So um, down here in the 
corner, or you can almost read it. It's individual and conformity in the corner. Do you have like Alex P. Keaton, right, from the 80s? Do people remember Family Ties, that show? A little bit, okay. I, it can be secret, that's fine. Um, so Alex P. Keaton is the son of two hippies, and he decided to rebel by becoming a Republican and wearing suits to school. And his hippie parents were completely confused. Um, but he was really all about individual success and financial gain and wanted to not be weird. He was really embarrassed of his hippie parents. Um, so you see like all these different kinds of things in the 80s, like so happy days, this very nostalgic view of the 50s, even though the Fonz is maybe, you know, maybe a little more counterculture than Leave it to Beaver. Um, you know, and you see uh, like, Way up here, you've got community, but conformity, like with 4-H clubs. So, like I said, some of this is kind of arbitrary. But I think some of the most interesting things that are happening are up in that top quadrant, where you have community-motivated and change-oriented activities going on. So things like uh, when people were protesting the Catholic Church uh, to bring awareness that AIDS was killing uh, gay people in our cities. Uh, that was a very dangerous thing to do. It wasn't only for your own safety that you would do that kind of a protest. It was for the community. Um, and the, the Gorilla Girls up there, this was a, a group of women and activists who were protesting outside of art galleries and saying like, why can you only be in an art gallery as a woman as a subject? Why are there not paintings from women in these galleries? So they were really pushing back against culture and cultural norms and what we are taking as the status quo. So, um, and I'll, these, these slides will be available online. Maybe I'll even give you an editable version so you can put things where you think they should be. Um, because, I'm, and you can add all the things that you feel I've left out. But now, we're gonna do the same thing with the free software movement. And again, I'm sure your opinions will change, uh, or your opinions will be different than mine. Um, so, one of the things that made me start thinking about this was I went to a talk um, at a conference last year, one that was more of a like an open source conference. And one of the keynotes was someone who was just like, I'm cool, but I just use whatever works. And I was like, what's the, what's the point of that? Like, whatever, and he was sort of proud of it. And he was like, you know, sometimes I pick open source and sometimes I pick proprietary stuff, because like, I'm a maverick like that. I don't, you know, I just use whatever's convenient. And I'm like, I don't, the last time I checked, like maverick doesn't really mean lazy or like just picking like the lowest hanging fruit. So like, I don't know how that got subverted. But uh, so, but, but he was like, you know, and he had cool hair, it was, it was a whole thing, you know. Um, and, it was, and so, but to me, I put that in this like least useful corner of like, <laughs> individual focus and then conformity like you know he doesn't want to be like oh occasionally if you're a free software user you, you know your friend comes over to watch something and you're like oh sorry it's a little fiddly thing I got to update VLC and they're like what why don't we just use Netflix and you're like oh, there's a lot of reasons why we don't you know so it's like okay you know sure it works and it's easy and everyone's doing it right which we heard in the 60s too right but uh they meant something different then. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so I kind of tried to like, align things in the free software movement on this, uh, on this, uh, this, this field here. So like, so like in-joke names for software, like things that people who are new to our community don't understand, they're fun for the existing community, but they don't help us bring new people in, right? So like they're not evil. This, like, these are, I'm not saying that one's like, evil, but it's not the best, right? So, um, you know, it's so kind of uh, the, the RTFM, like that's, if you're telling other people to read the freaking manual instead of helping them use your software, then you're not really interested in bringing more people in. So are you here for you because you feel super elite because you're using something no one else uses or are you here because you'd like to share? Um, and I would argue that the most interesting things are happening when you're more community oriented and really embrace the sharing and not just the personal identity of being, you know, like a person that uses software that no one else knows how to use. Um, so, you know, there's 
tons and tons of abandoned single developer projects. I know about that typo. But um, it's a, like, how useful are those? I mean, maybe they're a means to an end, so the, that person might eventually contribute on something else that's more interesting and more community focused because they got some practice. But you know, lots of abandoned, undocumented stuff on on uh, like GitHub or something is not is not really going to drive us towards change. Um, and then you can see, like, kind of uh, at the bottom there. Uh, We've had some amazing individuals within the free software movement that have brought us a long way, but if they don't get out of the way, then they eventually kind of get down to this place where they're not as community focused as they could be. Sometimes the best thing about being a leader is getting out of the way to let other people to rise and swell the ranks and, and join you in your crusade for free software. So, uh, and then, uh, you can see which projects I like the best because I put them up there. Again, you'll probably put your own up there. Um, but uh, I think there's some really great folks doing a lot of work to figure out how we can do things differently. Like, how can we make software available to people who haven't had it before, you know, haven't had that availability before? How can we fix problems that aren't being fixed by proprietary software? How can we change the game? Like, uh, I don't know if folks saw Ashish talk about Sandstorm earlier. Uh, Sandstorm is this project full of savvy folks that definitely know how to install their own, uh, you know, individual instances of awesome free software stuff that you would use to talk with people on the web. But they're building this thing to make it so that people who do not have that technical savvy can also do it. So it's not for them, because they already, you know, they couldn't build it if they didn't know how to do their own installations, right? So I think that that's where the most awesome stuff is happening in free software. So, um, and again, I will give you your own editable version. You can put things where you want them on your own. Um, so, but media and culture, of course, change over time. Uh, I'm going to draw a couple more parallels between the 80s and what we have happening today. Uh, so, media in the 80s, more than just the TV shows, of course. Although TV was big, like before the internet, like there was a lot of. That was a huge part of the, pro of, of the conversation. Um, we had a massive deregulation of television station ownership in the 80s, where um, the, there used to be um, this idea that you could only own a certain number of news outlets, radio, TV, and newspapers in a certain market, because they didn't want one person or one entity or even maybe one type of entity controlling the conversation. Uh, once that was deregulated, you see, this is, this is in the U.S., um, minority ownership fell drastically. So the rest of the television stations are uh, white, wealthy white men. So you see, uh, this, is, you know, this is why you don't see, you almost never see Asian Americans on TV, right? Because when you look at it, it's no one saying like, oh, I own a TV station, where's the show about me? If you're a white man that owns a TV station, then, then you're like, oh, good, I'm, I'm covered. You're, you're pretty well covered. Um, it's, a, it's just one of those things. Um, and so when we see consolidation, you know, setting aside the uh, mechanism by which that happens, but whenever we see consolidation of ownership in media, we see less diversity, less diversity of outlooks, less diversity of types of people that are participating and making decisions. Uh, the 80s responded to this uh, often with a lot of culture jamming. Uh, and there's some great stuff like ad busters. And um, uh, one of the things that was really popular in the 80s was people would, um, and I couldn't find a good picture of this, so I'm sorry, but uh, people would do graffiti on uh, billboards, things like, you know, like there would be one, um, you know, where it's like, oh, if this, uh, there's a famous one where it's, uh, it's a picture of a car and the, the, the lettering from the actual advertisement says, um, if this car was a lady, you'd pinch her butt or something like that. And someone um, scribbled that out and wrote, like, if this lady was a car, she'd run you down. <laughs> so, like, kind of just changing the, like, flipping the script and changing the conversation. Um, and some of them were a little bit more, like, whimsical. I don't know if anyone read the Illuminati trilogy. It was, like, all about this conspiracy theory stuff. A couple, okay. 
So the fnord is supposed to be this secret word that makes people subconsciously upset. And so I guess someone thought Ford was upsetting or should be upsetting and, uh, and made this piece of artwork. So, so we saw people, uh, even, you know, even in that uh, area, you know, era of uh, very uh, much a monopoly as far as who is doing the advertising and the television uh, programming, uh, people were pushing back and trying to, you know, muscle their way into the conversation anyway. So, uh, so I don't want to make it sound like all like doom and gloom. <laughs> and I think we can do a similar thing today, right? Uh, I mean, and I assume most of the people in this room agree with me because you came to spend Saturday talking about free software, which is awesome. I'm glad you're here. So media today is basically the web, right? Uh, net neutrality, we've talked about that. We talked about that a little bit this morning. Um, I think having that uh, consolidation of a couple of companies that own the airwaves is pretty bad. Um, and you see, like, uh, the situation where, like, you pay to play. So, like, again, we're seeing the more money the ha you have, the more interested you are in controlling the conversation. And then you get more money, and then you can control the conversation better, and it sort of... Um, it goes hand in hand, or, or like that uh, Ouroboros that eats its tail. Uh, another place where we're seeing that consolidation, uh, what we call it cons like centralization when we're talking about uh, media services and people interacting with each other on the web. So most of the services that people use on the internet today are like this, with one massive corporate entity in the middle mediating the conversation between all of us as little dots around the outside. So like, you'll notice there's no like, there's no side chat there. Like we're always going in through YouTube or Hotmail or Flickr or uh, AOL or whatever it is that you're using to then talk back out to our, our buddy who might even be sitting at the next desk. It's kind of weird. Um, and that lends itself to a fairly easy censorship. If you're not, ta if you have an intermediary, that intermediary can always just like, you know, like, oh, Hal's not here right now, like, gone. Um, and that is a very different web than, it's not even like a web, it's, it's like we're a little crust on top of a giant corporate entity. And that's a much more vulnerable place to be than an interconnected web where we talk to each other directly. So, I, I work, these are, images from Media Goblin, which is a decentralized media hosting project I work on. So, uh, and there are, other, there are other folks working on making a, a better, more decentralized web as well. The other thing that I also noticed is that um, free software is constantly under attack. I told you guys about the talk that I went to earlier this year. It was like, whatever works as like a mantra or a rallying cry of Myth, um, but uh, <laughs> I actually sent the organizers of that conference like a long note. Like I was really disappointed in your keynote, <laughs> um, and I'm sure they were like, "Oh, the free software lady sent us a note," but that's okay. <laughs> I've been called worse. Um, so it's, but uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know entirely know what to make of that. Um, this is something that I saw one year at OSCON. Does anyone want to guess uh, what company I saw this from? Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, which is really interesting, like make web not war. Uh, because this is from a company that has sued free software developers. Um, this is from a company that has frequently threatened to sue free software developers if they don't pay them royalties. Uh, they sue folks for patent infringement. They're uh, funding a patent troll, a couple, like a patent troll with three offices around the world. So Microsoft, uh, once they gobbled up Nokia, they had about 2,000 telecom patents that they um, offloaded for very cheap to uh, an entity called Conversant that has an office in West Texas, um, Luxembourg, which I'm told is like the Delaware of Europe. Yeah, and, and Ottawa. I still haven't been to Ottawa, so I don't know what's going on up there. Um, so, but, so this is a company that is making war on us all the time that is like, 
why are you getting so upset? Like, we're basically being gaslighted here. Like, stop being so defensive. Like, we, we brought candy to the conference and like we made these signs that said everyone should be nice. But on the back end, we're suing you. Like, and we're threatening you and we're spreading lies about your software. So free software is, is under attack. And uh, you know, that, that's just to kind of point out that um, you can never just be like, oh, the status quo, like will probably work out. That only works out for the player with the most money which, you know, Microsoft might, might be that player in this space. So, um, so that's like, that just means that we can't just leave it be and be like, oh, like the invisible hand will sort it out. The invisible hand will sort it out probably for Microsoft. So, so I'm glad you're here is what I'm saying. Um, so the hacker ethos, and, uh, and I'm not going to give you guys a, I don't have a manifesto, just so you know. Um, although I appreciate other manifestos. I just, I, I don't think I need to write one, but. Um, so the 1960s made the personal computer possible. And this was very much like a kind of born out of this counterculture idea. Um, computers before the 1960s filled up entire rooms and you had to get permission from your boss to use them for your project. Um, this isn't quite that. I just, this is a really good one of another old computer. <laughs> That mouse is like this big. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the personal computer as, a, as an idea meant like you didn't have to ask anyone for permission to use the computer for your projects. It was going to happen in your house. Like you could do it privately and, and your boss was not involved. Uh, or anyone else who might have, uh, you know, might be in charge of the scheduling for that computer. Uh, so the, the personal computer was really going to be an extension of you as an individual, like a, a, an empowering machine to let you do whatever you wanted, which is, which is exciting. But, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it does that and sometimes you have 4,000 emails in your <laughs> inbox. So it's, sometimes it's empowering and sometimes it's a pain in the butt. But, um, you know, so that's, this, but the idea of the personal computer had very much the personal control of the computer tied up in it, I think. Um, the 80s brought manifestos. Uh, the GPL, which is awesome and has allowed us to spread software in a lot of different places. Uh, in some ways, like we're having to have this conversation or even like go to events with someone who says like, whatever works because we've been so successful, right? Like, if we managed to just keep, like, our secret elite club, then we would never have to interact with someone who is like, I don't know if I have 100% drank the Kool-Aid yet. And I'm going to say that that is not a problem. It's an opportunity. Okay? So free software today is everywhere. Uh, this, if people remember the OLPC, I, I love free software. I love this picture. Um, but I would argue that with uh, great power comes great responsibility. So, and also fun. So like part of this idea is like style and substance. Like it's great that we're having fun and we have like wacky t-shirts with animals on them and things like that. And that like, you know, maybe there will sometimes be cake. And so I'm not saying don't have cake and don't have weird t-shirts and don't have funny animals, but that like at the same time, I wanna make sure that we're also continuing to build a movement that changes the relationship we have to computing. So. This is where I'm hoping that uh, the 80s can possibly help. So, uh, so one, work on something that makes the world a better place. I'm not opposed to you making money while you do that. Uh, so, um, I, you know, hackers gotta eat, which is one of the things we always say at Media Goblin because, well, they do. Um, so, uh, but if you could find your way to eating and then also working on something that actually improves the world, then I think that's a win. So, um, and I'm not going to tell you to not eat, but that you, if, you're, if you have a job that does not fall into that category, maybe keep your eyes out for something else. This is actually a great place to network and find one of those other types of jobs. Uh, make our projects enthusiastically open. Uh, all kinds of folks. Um, people watch Fraggle Rock, 
they had like all these different puppets. Yay! Oh, there's a couple younger hands there I saw. Um, <laughs> that one's a little bit later. Um, but if your project is enthusiastically open, then you're open to new ideas. You're getting people that might be able to help you with different kinds of things. Um, new people, like if we continue to preach to the choir, we're not going to grow the free software movement. So, uh, and then treat everyone like a person. Uh, this is, do people watch Goonies? Everyone's seen Goonies, right? Actually, right in the Pacific Northwest, like practically in Microsoft's backyard, right? Um, but the great thing about Goonies is that even though all these kids had like different skills or brought something different to the table, like everyone was able to participate and had a little piece that they were able to do. And I think that uh, the more our free software projects look like that, the better off we're gonna be. So if you have only coders and no one who takes care of your website, uh, then you know you might wanna ask, why is that? Um, Projects that have developers and translators and folks that want to do artwork for them and people that want to bring cupcakes to the party, much, much better. Uh, not to keep hammering on the cake, but it's important. People, it's, especially if it's volunteers, like people are showing up and spending their like otherwise would be fun time with you to do work on your project, like you can at least give them a cookie. So, um, also, uh, get rid of your Rambos. And I am told by my husband that the first movie, he's fine. It's the second and third movie where he's really kind of a jerk. But what I mean by this is if you have people in your project that yell at newcomers but like are cool and you can't, like, get rid of them. They're just not gonna help you in the long run. Uh, or try and help them become less Rambo-like if you can on the back end. But some, I mean, sometimes once you get here, it's kind of hard to back down. But, um, I mean, if you've got this literally happening and you're, you know, but, I mean, but if you have someone that thinks, like, death threats in IRC are funny, like, get rid of that person. They are not going to help you grow your project. They're not going to be fun to have in your project. Eventually, they're going to chase away everyone who is not like them in your project, and it'll be you and ten Rambos. So even if, you have to, even if you have to backload the motivation there with a little bit of selfishness to get rid of that Rambo when he pops up, like, do it. Um, and, and I think that is, like, really important. I could probably give a whole talk on the, like, how toxic environments are not a good idea. But um, if, you, if you have someone like that, you either have to, I don't know, de-escalate them or, or get them out. And then finally, um, embrace new ideas and new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking of things. I think that to get more people to use free software, we're going to have to do a little bit better than we made a clone of this proprietary thing that looks exactly like the proprietary version but doesn't work quite as well because we didn't get the anti-aliasing font patent thing sorted out or whatever. So, uh, like, there's nothing that's, like, less exciting than, like, oh, it's this whole thing, we all built it together, and it's just like what you're used to, but a little crummier. It's, <laughs> right? Because I do feel like sometimes when you're like, hey, oh, what are you running? Like, oh, yeah, it's, and they're like, and, and you can tell, like, there's almost, like, the little thought bubble, like, it's kind of like Windows, but crummier, and I'm like, no, it's not, there's so much more. But, um, you know, so... So let, let's keep trying to build some of those things. I think that um, looking at different ways of organizing stuff, uh, like we'll write our own games, we don't have to re-implement ones that have already been done. Um, that is what is gonna get people excited. Like, what do, you, what do you guys got over there? I mean, that is what is gonna get people excited uh, to come over and check out free software. So I might have spoken fast because of the coffee. But um, if you enjoyed uh, some of these topics, um, the, uh, what the Dormouse said is more on the computer history if you want to read about the 60s and how uh, that influenced personal computing. That book is great. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Back to Our Future is about uh, the idea of the 50s and the 60s, Essos, and that uh, argument, conversation, whatever, reverberating through American culture to this day. Um, super interesting. Um, if you want more pictures of giant mice and like room-sized monitors, then the Engelbart Institute is for you. And the Computer History Museum, also full of old, old computers, which is super fun. Um, and so I, um, I have picture credits, of course, and I would be willing to take your questions. Thanks.
or comments since it was like not exactly technical. So what do people think? Rambos, ready to kick them out? Hello. So yeah. I, I got a question, Deb. So, oh, yeah. So what do you do if your project is led by a Rambo? Oh. What do you do if your project is led by a Rambo? Well, uh, and there are a couple of famous examples of this, but we're being recorded, and I have no desire to be doxxed today. So um, <laughs> uh, some, some communities have tried uh, talking to that person, and I would argue that eventually you might want to consider forking. I mean, just that, you know, for smaller projects, that's more doable than larger projects. Um, but yeah, it's the earlier you can like kind of nip that, the the better. But if your benevolent dictator for life is one of those, then I think you have to slowly start taking away the toys that they're not using and making the community around them uh, sort of autonomous and separate. If you if you can't, you know, if you really feel like you've tried every other thing, and I know that's much easier said than done. So. Um, you know, this is this is to be inspirational. You'll have to figure out exactly the nuts and bolts on your own Rambo, but I would talk about it offline. Please don't mention anyone's name in the next two minutes here. Um, so uh, other questions or comments, or if you have, if, if someone's like, I know what to do with Rambos, I would love to hear it. Anyone? Okay, yeah? Mm. Yeah, that's actually, uh, so Donnie Burkholz gave that talk. That was the one I was alluding to, I, um, d but yeah, uh, how assholes are killing your project. And um, uh, sorry if that word is a bleep. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and there's actually a whole book about it that I think uses the word jerks. But um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's science and uh, numbers behind it. Like you can, Carefully, you can track over time, like one annoying person on the mailing list being a jerk, and then like unresolved, like all of a sudden you have two, and then three, and then four, and then like the ratio of jerks to not jerks, like just steadily goes that way. Because what happens is um, it's kind of it's it's like how um, how ants communicate or something, like be, like I, you can't even put your finger on it, but. Um, it's a, it's like by allowing one jerk to continue unchecked, like some sort of, uh, you know, Aquaman sense goes out to other jerks where they're like, oh, hey guys, I found a place where we can act like jerks. <laughs> and then they're all in there. They're in your channel. They're on your mailing list. They're like, oh yeah, hey, it's great to see you since after we got kicked out of that other project and now we found another place to be jerks together or something. So uh, at least that's what I imagine is going on. But it's, it is basically like you, once you, if you let it go, you've, you've hung up a sign saying like, jerks welcome. And you don't want to do that. So it's, and I know people are conflict averse and it's, you really, um, I did another talk where we, um, discussed like how you might uh, say that conversation because I had been I had been listening to some other people talking about a I, and I actually don't remember the name of the person like oh we should really talk about so and so and, and they were had all these like weird like well maybe we can tell them we're all gonna move to different IRC channel and then we'll have a real conversation somewhere else and I'm like he's gonna figure that out that's dumb like you can't like this is weird like so um, I would say to address it head on and, and without like, no, without the name calling, we're calling, you know, like this abstract person a jerk. I wouldn't call an actual person a jerk in person. Um, but, you know, to say to someone, so when you do like X, Y, and Z behavior, it has this effect on the project. You know, and they may not know that. And if they, and if they do and they're like, oh, sweet, like there's tears, great, then oh, you absolutely have to get rid of that person. But if they're like, oh, I thought we were all here to kind of just like, you know, hang out and be jerks with each other. And it's like, no. And they're like, oh, oh all right, maybe I should go somewhere else. Like, <laughs> it, it could go like that. Um, you know, it, but honesty, I think, is going to be your best approach. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah. And Duke, uh, uh, Diversity. A little bit different, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, that's, I, it's, um, and there's a whole paper on that from Free Press, which is the organization that works on net neutrality. Um, and so, yeah, the bef I didn't have the before, but it was, it was better. It wasn't great, it was, a, a, you know, I don't wanna make it sound like it was the Amazon land or something, but um, it, was, uh, it was better, and then it got worse. So, yeah, but if you want, um, you can totally email me and I'll send you a copy of the report. Sure. Yeah. And Free Press is a great organization. So, yeah, Remy. So, we talked a lot about the bad actors. What about the good ones? What, what about the, the good ones? Communities and projects that are like doing it right. And what are some of good best practices that you want to share? Yeah. So, which projects are doing it right? And um, I think that. Uh, I mean, I'm biased, I try to, I, like I, a lot of the ones that I'm involved with, I think are doing it right. <laughs> but that's, but it's chicken egg, I don't know. Um, so uh, yeah, so Open Hatch uh, helps projects figure out how to navigate that. I happen to be on their boards, so I think they do a good job on that. Uh, the Genome Outreach Program for Women, which is now called Outreachy, does a great job of figuring out how to get people who have not previously been involved in free software involved in free software and make sure those on-ramps are illuminated and, and, uh, and easy for newcomers to find. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, people are starting to have more conversations about like how do we, uh, how do we make our documentation feel, people feel like they're really part of the team. And um, so I think there's starting to be a lot better awareness, um, especially if you see a project that has listed uh, that they um, aren't only looking for coders, but mention that they are looking for web people, they're looking for artists, they're looking for translators, they're looking for outreach people, then you know that they understand they need the whole package. Um, and so I would say that uh, that's kind of a benchmark of what to look for, is that they, they understand that there's, there's code and there's a whole bunch of other things that go with it to uh, get that all the way across the finish line to being a project that non-coders would wanna use. So, yeah, back in the corner. Yeah, you mentioned about getting rid of uh, Rambos. Rambo yeah. Yeah, so how do you get open source hipsters and benevolent Rambos that might not actually be evil, but just kind of be doing it wrong to be better? Um, so yeah, um, again, I would say just being honest and letting people know, like there's not a secret, if there was a weird secret trick, like uh, I would totally tell you, I promise. But, um, uh, but I think actually just being honest and saying, Oh, so when you do this behavior or you say that on the mailing list, um, it, makes, it makes people uncomfortable or it makes people sad or it makes people feel unappreciated. Um, and, and, and we're trying to have a project where people don't feel sad or underappreciated. We, we, we want them to feel, you know, like we're glad they're here and that we appreciate their work. So, um, you know, and so, so sometimes it's that, I guess I had a conversation with someone recently who used a, a word that is maybe less immediately offensive in Europe but is weird over here and, you know, so there was a little bit of back channel and it's like, well, you know, and so there was some back and forth and I was like, so, you know, that kind of, it makes you seem like a sexist, I assume because you're here and you're friends with some of the other people that I, I know are pretty decent judges of character, that's not you, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was like, okay. And he's like, but you know, I still wanna be able to say whatever I want. And then I kind of came back and I said, well, you know, I, I understand that. And now that we've like had a whole conversation about it, like I understand where you're coming from. But um, for anyone who wasn't here on this back channel, you look like a sexist and you're sort of, you're letting other sexists know that, that you're like, they, they look at that and think like, oh, one of us. 
And so I guess you have to, you know, and so I said, I'm, I guess you have to decide if you want to offer random scattershot encouragement to sexists or to women and other feminists. And he was kind of like, oh, yeah, when you put it like that, like, yeah, I don't, if I had to pick, then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to pick random encouragement to sexists. So, 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 yeah, so it could be difficult, but. Mm. I just want to say this as someone who is involved in the community or is getting involved in the community. Brand new stuff is scary <coughs> and really hard to figure out. So there is mm -hmm. some use for that kind of thing. Away from. There is some use oh, for yeah. to help people make a transition. Right. So the point is that, um, yeah, that sometimes. Uh, it's nice to do the really good stuff. We need the in between stuff. The in between stuff. And I totally agree. And there are some projects that are doing um, kind of a little bit of both. Like, I think the LibreOffice suite is a really great example of if you're coming from Microsoft Office, like, it's not going to be like, whoa, you put everything somewhere totally different. But, um, but you're going to be like, oh, I type in the big white box in the middle, right? Like, yes, you still type in the big white box in the middle. You're going to be okay. But then there's some other features that are there that, you know, that aren't necessarily in the proprietary version. So that one's a good, like, gateway and then kind of, like, check out the possibilities. So, um, so that's a great point that it doesn't need to be, like, weird and unfamiliar. Right. Thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that you're, you're coming in. Uh, yeah. Oh, we're at time. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys, and uh, I'll see you guys at the conference. <laughs>